This is dramatic. It's physical, it's intense. The importance of the moment is clear from the scoreboard. This is how most sports dramas are done. But what if you are making a sports drama about chess? The Queen's Gambit is actually a mixture of two types of stories, a sports drama and a coming of age story. But all the normal tools of a sports drama don't really work for chess. Just imagine. They can't rely on the usual physical drama of sports dramas because chess is an intellectual contest. So how do they make it dramatic? Now or never. In the first few matches, while Scheibel is teaching Beth how to play, the show is also teaching us, the audience, how to read what's going on in the games, so that later, when the stakes are a little higher than they are in this basement, we will still be able to understand what's going on. Of course, they aren't teaching us how to play chess. That would be impractical, and is basically the whole problem. Chess is a really complicated game. There is absolutely no way to show your average viewer a mid-game board and have them be able to immediately understand what's going on the same way you can with most sports. So instead of trying to get us to actually understand what's going on in the game, they teach us to read the emotions of the characters in order to understand what's going on. To see what I mean, let's look closely at some of the early games with Scheibel. After the first game, we cut to the second game in progress. This one teaches us how to read the importance of one moment. Scheibel lays a trap for Beth by moving his bishop right next to her queen. Then we get a close-up of Beth where she looks up from the board at her opponent, then looks back at the board. We can see from this look that she knew this was a dumb move. Why would he just throw away his bishop? And so she looked at him to try and read his intentions. But she couldn't see it, and so falls for the trap. By focusing on her trying to read his intentions, we move the drama from being about what's happening on the board to being about the intellectual battle between the two characters. Later, when Beth finds herself unable to see what her opponent is doing, they will reference this moment. The third game teaches us how to read the overall state of a match. Now, I'm not a chess player. I know the rules, sure, but I can't play well. I can't look at a board and understand easily what's going on. But I can still tell Beth is winning here. Her pieces are taking up most of the board, and when she moves, she has to reach her arm across the table which visually shows us that she is in control of the game. But it's not just what they do on the board, we can see based on their acting who is winning. Scheibel's expression, his breathing, and the way Beth looks at him while he looks at the board clearly communicates that she is in control. He's looking at the board for a way out, and she's studying him for any sign that he's found one. Fundamentally, these strategies allow people who don't really know chess to follow the action by using the characters to convey the meaning of the action through the shots and acting. So let's fast forward a bit and see how they apply these strategies in the first tournament, the Kentucky State Championship. We only see four matches. The first is just one move, and the second focuses on one moment. We start at the end of the game where Cook lays what he thinks is a trap on Beth's queen. Beth keeps her eyes on the board and makes a move which seems to fall into the trap. As Cook smirks at her and takes her queen, Beth gives him a sideways look and a very small smile and ties the game up with her bishop. This is exactly how Scheibel baited her in the game we looked at earlier, and once again it's communicated mostly through acting. The next two matches also introduce two new elements to help clarify the drama, the soundtrack and the relationship between the two players. From the start of the tournament, the show had been building up both Towns and Beltic and Beth's interest in them, and the match against Towns is the first time the show gets to cash in on that sort of buildup. On the one hand, you have Beth's clear attraction to him, and on the other, you have his interest in her, 
skilled young girl, and a complete tournament novice. This is also where the matches get their own scoring. The game goes through emotional stages which match up with the stages of a chess game, and you can hear them mirrored in the soundtrack. During their openings, the light triplets create a curious and inquisitive mood as they trade glances, sizing each other up. But the score slowly builds towards this moment where Towns contemplates, then smiles as he understands how much of a challenge the game is going to be. We don't even see the move that causes this reaction. It's all about character. In contrast, the match against Beltic opens with no soundtrack at all to emphasize Beth's revulsion and rage. The silence builds towards a total loss of control where she has to flee to the bathroom for some right verbal self-abuse and a pill, which connects the match back to the coming of age story. Against Towns, the music goes through a transition as they move into the mid game. As their focus tightens, the music slows down, drops in register, and becomes more contemplative. Beth gets the satisfaction of seeing Towns' bewilderment as she outflanks his queen. She is in control, and he is beginning to feel his back to the wall. In the end game, their jackets are off, and Towns focuses at maximum, while Beth casually, methodically, and almost coyly executes her end game, and the music matches her coy self-assurance. The match against Beltic also has a soundtrack transition, which comes right here during her trip to the bathroom. To match the self and drug abuse, the transition is from silence to darkness, a darkness that runs through the score for the rest of the match. The music does so much here to clarify the emotion of each shot. Despite how mad she was, she doesn't gloat, but she does allow herself one controlled burn. Son of a bitch. I think that's it. No, I can get out of this. I don't think so. Maybe, if you'd gotten here on time. Interestingly, we don't even see the move Beltic chooses next. We watch his face, then we cut immediately to Beth's exasperated reaction. It doesn't work. I don't have to use the queen. Move. I'll just cover it with the bishop and- Move. This is the only move in the whole match that doesn't appear on screen. Every other one either had a close-up as they moved the piece or a shot of the board right after. But just because most of the moves are shown doesn't mean I can follow what's happening on the board in a strategic sense. As I discussed these two matches, I hardly reference what was happening on the board at all because I just don't know. Partly it's because the games are too complicated for me, I don't know that much about chess, but also because it's not really the focus. In the match against Beltic, they only show the whole board early on. As they move into the mid game, they stop showing those shots entirely in favor of quick close-ups. I can't even really tell what they're doing. I certainly have no idea what's going on in the board, but I think this is on purpose. I think they stop showing the board because they want us to focus on the characters instead of trying to puzzle out the details of the match. Then, once we focus on the characters, they use them to tell us exactly what each move means, skipping right past what the moves are. It's brilliantly done, and even more impressive because it seems like such a thin line to walk. Focus too much on the chess and we'll start to focus on it and then get confused and bored. Focus too little on it and it'll seem like the chess isn't even part of the story. I think they nailed the balance, especially in this episode. They draw us in with the characters and then use every single tool they have to make it as dramatic as possible. Character, acting, scoring, editing, framing, they all build up the drama of the chess without focusing on it too much. It's incredible. As the show goes on, they use a variety of different and new techniques to portray the tournaments. This helps break up the pacing and keep the tournaments fresh and lets them explore different character relationships and expositional styles. 
I find some of them work better than others. I didn't really like Beth's voiceovers because it leans really hard into telling over showing, but it does help develop and flesh out her relationship with her new mom. The radio narrators work better because they can explore more advanced chess concepts and don't detract from Beth's acting the way having her explain her feelings to us does. The tournament in Ohio mixes it up by using some new unique edits set to music and finishes with the clearest example of their style in the entire show. Earlier in the episode, Benny says, The key is to not be tentative. You have to play with absolute confidence. You know, I can tell in the first move whether someone's got that or whether they don't, just from how they move that first piece. So when it comes time for their game... Well, I never thought you'd let me trade queens. You didn't think so either. They only show the first move before they cut to them discussing how Benny lost. This is Benny reaching out from the show and explaining its methods to the audience. The drama comes not from what the move is, but by how the character does it. But the reason we went into all the detail about those matches is because they build on that foundation. They take the character relationships and acting and create not just dramatic clarity for an audience that doesn't understand the intricacies of chess, but a truly incredible story. The last episode of this show is one of the greatest television climaxes I have ever seen. At her lowest point, Beth goes back to the orphanage and in classic dramatic fashion, faces the demons of her past so that she can conquer her future, and they tie the two threads of her story, the chess and the coming of age, together by making her moment of dramatic triumph not her victory against Borgov, but when she is finally able to visualize the game without the drugs. The entire story builds towards this one moment, the support of her friends, her struggle with drugs, her losses to Borgov, this is the payoff that ties them all together. This is a truly special show. I never imagined chess could be so dramatic. I can just imagine the pitch meeting for this. You want to make a television show about chess? Isn't that going to be kind of boring? It's honestly incredible that this show got made, let alone how awesome it turned out. It's not a perfect show. It's got bits that range from feeling a little off to downright obnoxious, but it's gotten me thinking about all the other stories out there that we don't typically think of being suited for the screen and how they could be infused with drama. It's changed the way I think about visual media, and that's awesome. But I think it's also a good reminder about what makes stories, all stories, really work. You can make the most physically astounding, stimulating, and dramatic scenes in the world, but if you don't ground them in the characters and story, it won't actually be dramatic. The Queen's Gambit goes very far to the other end. It has no physical drama and still makes it work. But even the most physically and visually stimulating moments imaginable still need to be about the characters. 